Hi guys, good evening. Uh, I hope I am visible and audible to you all. Uh, just give me a quick confirmation on that. Uh, so this is the part two of the top hundred images arranged in order of importance. So we did uh, a part one yesterday, and we shall be continuing with the same today. Uh, my name is Zainab, and I've done my MBBS and MD in radiology from AIMS New Delhi, and uh, uh, we shall be discussing the most important images. Uh, um, today and we'll do it in an integrated manner such that you know um, uh, you can get a holistic idea and that is how the questions are going to be going forward wherein you'll have questions uh, wherein they'll give you the clinical feature they'll ask you diagnosis or management so you know we'll study uh, right from the pathophysiology to the management uh, with everything right uh, okay so this is the schedule for the upcoming classes. So uh, to, tonight at 10 o'clock, we have a strategy session for INICT. A lot of you are talking about it in the chat. Yeah, so we'll be talking uh, about what should be your uh, right uh, strategy and approach at this point of time. And we'll also talk about, uh, you know, the resources that you have to use, how you should plan these two months and what are the focus areas as far as INICT is concerned. Uh, you know, you it's a very um, strategizable exam uh, is uh, what I feel, INICT. So do it in the right direction and do the right things. And I'm sure that you can do very well with this amount of time as well, you know. So that is what we shall be discussing tonight at 10 o'clock. This is going to be on YouTube, yeah. Oh, sorry, this is going to be on the app. Everything is going to be on the app except for this top 100 series which is going on. So this we'll be meeting every day at 4 o'clock for this entire week so that, you know, we can finish it in a go. So August and September, basically first week only, I want to finish this in the uh, in this coming week, all right? So in a flow. So we'll finish this off on YouTube every day at 4 o'clock, not just Monday to Wednesday, but this will continue, you know, after Wednesday also. So till Sunday, I'm planning that we'll finish it off, all right? And apart from that, tomorrow on the app again, we have this 6 to 8 p.m. marathon session on PSM, the most important thing. This again is something that INICT loves, you know. So there are these um, loves of INICT, the topics that INICT loves to ask, you know, and that's been going on since years. I mean, you might feel that I am very ancient, uh, uh, you know, as far as INICT topper goes, but you know, the same topic I have studied, the same topic my seniors have told me that these are important and same topics, you know, I'm still telling you and these are coming again and again. So that's why, you know, it's very, very important. Okay. Um, yeah, and then for the plus subscribers, we have this systemic uh, integrated batch course, which is starting. So we'll be doing this on first and second. Yeah, so lots of classes which are lined up. So this is the schedule. Uh, for those of you who are looking for the subscription, this is the offer which is going on, which is unlocked 20. So you get up to 35% off, right? So those of you who are complaining about that one hour limit, you know, so subscription is the way to go. And I think the prices have been slashed right now. So if you're really looking to subscribe, now is the best time. Yeah. And if you want a prep ladder also, you can get iconic subscription. Okay. And uh, yeah, so this is a batch course I was talking about, which has begun since 25th of August. Uh, and QBank 2.0 by Unacademy is also coming up. And this is curated by um, uh, educators from Unacademy, right? So few of the educators have worked on it. So it's definitely going to be uh, good. Yeah. So we begin with the 18th image. We had done 17 images in the first class. And this is what we are doing. Okay. Thank you so much, Sri Jewels, for your kind words. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so tell me what this is, guys. Uh, we can start off with this. This is something which has come up in INICT exam. First, tell me imaging modality, tell me sequence, and tell me diagnosis. For diagnosis, I'll have to give you some history. So the history is going to be that there is history of trauma here. A very, very typical history will be given that there's history of high energy trauma. And the person is either comatose when he presents to you or he has a very low GCS score. Right. When you go ahead and do the NCCT, which is the initial investigation that is done for any trauma patient, for any head trauma, NCCT head is the investigation of choice. It turns out to be normal or you only see small patique. So what they'll do is they'll ask you the diagnosis here. They'll ask you the diagnosis and they'll ask you what do you want to do next to confirm the diagnosis. Very nice. So the diagnosis, as all of you are correctly saying, is DAI. It stands for, how is my handwriting? DAI, which is diffuse axonal injury. Yeah, so it is diffuse axonal injury, which is the diagnosis here, as the name suggests. What's happening here is axonal shearing. Yeah, so axonal shearing is happening, shearing of uh, 
the axons and that is why you don't really have a lot of hematomas thank you you don't have a lot of hematomas you don't have a lot of hemorrhages but you just have these tiny tiny petechial hemorrhages right and that is because axonal injury has happened so gcs will fall patients overall neurological status is bad but you don't see a bad ct like you don't see a lot of hemorrhages going around right so that's the rationale one more point about this investigation of choice so everywhere else in head trauma investigation of choice is going to be ncct and this is the only exception which is di bas ho gaya the only investigation of choice uh, exception is di where the investigation of choice is mri yeah my handwriting is actually good it's the uh, tab which is not compatible yeah okay bas up enough about handwriting so mri and the sequence is swi so this was asked independently as a names question so always in any exam that you write whether it's fmg neat or inict one question on head trauma is for sure and this is the one which is the highest likelihood of getting asked you know so they'll give you this clinical history they'll ask you the diagnosis or they'll give you the sequence so here what you see are all of these black spots so on a susceptibility weighted imaging yesterday also we had uh, discussed this so on susceptibility weighted imaging these black spots are your hemorrhages right so it can be hemorrhage or calcification both which will induce these black spots with this set, sort of a uh, history it's going to be these tiny hemorrhages which we are seeing as these black spots called blooming very nice yeah so this is blooming okay so this is about mri remember susceptibility weighted imaging and you're going to see this blooming now they can also ask you one question what do you see on histopath so because there's shearing of axons there's tearing of axons i'm going to see these empty looking neurons which are called as retraction balls they are called as retraction balls so remember this is the histopath finding of uh, a di lesser known fact swi stands for susceptibility weighted imaging yeah we have discussed this in yesterday's class on uh, the app okay so this is an mri sequence that will test anything which distorts the magnetic field which induces susceptibility like hemorrhage or calcification if that is there we'll see this black black spot here okay apart from this the other question what is the staging a lot of you are also telling staging yes correct it is the adams staging that we use so in increasing or in increasing order of severity or in you know worsening of prognosis the stages would be first stage is where you have gray matter white matter involvement stage 2 is where you have corpus callosum involvement and stage 3 is where you have brain stem involvement so the prognosis goes from worse as we go from stage 1 to stage 3 right so this is everything in a nutshell that you need to know about diffuse axonal injury the question will come what is the diagnosis and what is the sequence and what will be the investigation of choice right so number 17 number 18 done number 19 again on the same lines of head trauma what do we have here can you see how there are these hyper densities yeah so this is acute hemorrhage on ncct no i mean just keep this in mind they will usually not ask you this uh, so not very important but yeah okay so uh, that was for so me earlier all right that was not for this image so for this image this is very very important so here remember ncct this is acute hemorrhage and based on the shape you have to remember two things right so whenever you see this idli shape or lens shaped or biconvex shape this is edh so you know this is right this is left yeah so here in this image this is the right side which is showing you edh here which you can remember as idli shaped lens shaped or by convex on the other hand on the left side can you see how there is this white hemorrhage which is crescent shaped yeah so crescent shape hai ya banana shaped hemorrhage hai so remember that is sdh the difference edh remember it's going to be because of an arterial injury most common artery to be affected is going to be the middle meningeal artery sth is going to be because of a venous injury the bridging veins are what are commonly injured the middle meningeal artery you know runs beneath the terion right where you have all of the uh, sutures meeting that's the terion so when you have terional fracture the middle meningeal artery gets affected so that is usually the history here there is here you will have a history of trivial trauma a bathroom fall or maybe a boxer or an alcoholic patient who's frequently falling down would be the history that you will get here apart from that what you need to remember clinically lucid interval It is the interval between loss of consciousness and then again loss of consciousness that brief period where the patient regains consciousness is lucid interval which is a feature of edh and not 
SPH. Fine. So remember these differences and you are good to go. Any question which is possible will be asked. All right. So yeah, based on the shape itself, you can remember about sutures and midline. So because the dura is attached to the sutures, yeah, this is where we have the sutures. This is where we have the sutures. So because dura is attached, extra dural, outside the dura, it won't be able to cross the sutures. Whereas SDH, you can see here, right, that it's crossing the sutures. If SDH gets to cross sutures, it will not get to cross midline. Yeah, so it doesn't cross the midline, whereas an EDH possibly can cross the midline as well. Right. So, these are the points that you want to remember about EDH state. Usually, usually questions come from identification. Okay. Going on to number 20. Again, something white on the NCCT, something hyperdense, shaped like a star. Yeah. So, this is the basilar cisterns that you are seeing. Anytime this hyperdensity is in a basilar cistern, what's your diagnosis? Very nice. It is acute subarachnoid hemorrhage, acute SH. Now my question to you, what is the most common cause of acute SH? Yeah, this is also called as star of death. So remember, idli, EDH, banana, STH, star, SH. Yeah, what is the most common cause of acute SH? It is actually trauma, right? So again, on the lines of head trauma, trauma is the most common cause. But when asked, what is the most common cause of spontaneous slash non-traumatic SH? Then it becomes aneurysm rupture. Yeah, so we will have aneurysm rupture as the most common cause of spontaneous SH. These aneurysms could be called berry aneurysms. These aneurysms could be called saccular aneurysm, right? So last year, neat question, very simple. Uh, saccular aneurysm rupture leads to, one line saval bhi aate hai, it is SH, right? Subarachnoid hemorrhage. So now, let's say that a person does not have trauma. The person has aneurysmal rupture. What would be the clinical feature that the patient will present with? Very typical, you must have heard it. It's a thunderclap headache, right? It's not hypertension, it's berry aneurysm rupture, right? Hypertension we saw yesterday, cutaminal bleed, yeah? So, clinical feature would be correct. Thunderclap headache, wherein you will have a, a headache which reaches crescendo very, very soon. Within seconds, it will reach its maximum severity. Or the other phrase would be worst headache of life, hai na? So, ya to likha hoga thunderclap headache or it would be written worst headache of life. Again, it occurs very, very quickly. It's very rapid. Yeah, so that's the clinical feature. So, then if they give you this history and that they ask you what is the initial investigation that you will do, always NCCT. So, NCCT will give you this kind of a picture wherein you see the star of death. Then they'll ask you what is the next step? What do you want to do next to see the aneurysm? So next we are going to go ahead with a CT angio which becomes the investigation of choice. Yeah. So the CT and it's for both FMG and me. This is useful for everybody right irrespective of exam. So CT angiography remember is the best investigation which will actually show you that aneurysm. What is the most common site where the aneurysm is expected? It's the circle of Willis. Within the circle of Willis remember it's at the junction of anterior communicating and ACA. So, anterior communicating and anterior cerebral artery ke junction pe you will have this aneurysm. That is why one more question came from INICT last year that what will be the clinical picture that will be seen if there is a very big aneurysm at ACOM ACA junction. So, you have the optic chiasma right there, isn't it? So, basically the optic chiasma can get compressed and you can have bitemporal hemianopia because of an aneurysm arising at the junction of ACOM and ACA. So, that also solves one more question. Now, if they ask you what is the treatment, what is the gold standard investigation? It becomes this investigation where you see the artery, DSA, digital subtraction angiography. So, you see the vessel, the background is subtracted. This is the gold standard because I can treat also. I can, can you all see this? So, this can also come as an image based question. You will see this big aneurysm here. Which artery? Can somebody tell me which artery is this aneurysm in? Again, it's the most common artery. So, this is the internal carotid artery and can you see how it has these two branches? The branch which is going here along the corpus callosum. Remember, this is the ACA branch and the branch which goes here, this is the terminal branch which is MCA. So, where is the aneurysm? Hai? It's in the anterior cerebral artery. So, there's an ACA aneurysm. So, you can diagnose as well as treat it with the help of 
coiling. So endovascularly, we can do a coiling. Apart from that, it's a very big aneurysm, giant aneurysm. A surgeon would go and clip it. All right. So clipping and coiling are the two main uh, this thing, two main uh, modalities for treatment of any aneurysm. Okay. So this is about acute SH. Fine. Uh, one of you mentioning nimodipine. So yeah, after the SH is treated or ba basically what are the complications of SH once it has ruptured, any bleeding uh, basically which has happened, any aneurysm which has ruptured, there are a few issues which occur later on. One of which is hydrocephalus. Yeah, so you can basically have obstruction by this bleeding which has occurred here. It can result in hydrocephalus. The other thing is what is the other complication? It is vasospasm, right? So the arteries can undergo vasospasm and that is why prophylactically these patients are given nimodipine. Right? So nimodipine is again something that can be asked from this topic. So this takes care of SH as a whole, okay? Yeah, yeah, same uh, full kit, same investigation. But yeah, you need to know that PCKD has a higher predisposition for berry aneurysm. So you want to screen these patients also. You don't, uh, you know, want to wait. Ki chalo thunderclap hoga, fir karenge. You can screen them using CT angiography before the presentation itself. Yeah, so this is about SH. Image number 21, again an emergency, very, very important. What are we seeing here? This is a CT image. This is a contrast enhanced CT also, you can use the term CT angiography because the vessels have the maximum contrast here. And what do we see? So here, this is the ascending aorta. Can you see how it has been divided into two? Correct. So this is aortic dissection. What is the most common risk factor for aortic dissection? It is going to be hypertension. Apart from that, remember the other important risk factor, any collagen uh, disease. Yeah, so any connective tissue disorder like Marfan's disease, Erler-Danlos. In fact, syphilis, tertiary syphilis can also lead to aortic dissection. So all of these are your risk factors wherein the intima will tear and it will lead to a dissection wherein we have a true lumen and we have a false lumen. How to identify? Very simple. True lumen will be smaller, false lumen will be bigger. True lumen will have more whiter contrast because that's where the contrast is coming first and false lumen will be darker. Okay, so this is the intima in between separating and forming true lumen and false lumen. Okay, so this is about aortic dissection. Remember, the investigation of choice will depend if the patient is stable or unstable. Last year ka sawal. So if the patient is stable, it is definitely going to be CECT or CT angiography that we want to go for. But if the patient is unstable, then we cannot shift the patient for a CT scan. We can do a bedside investigation called TEE, which stands for transesophageal echocardiography. So we can do a bedside echocardiography in within the esophagus and we can actually visualize the aorta and the dissection flap. Yeah, so this is about the investigation. This is what is usually asked. Then you can also get a question on the management. How do you manage the patients? It will depend on the type of the uh, dissection. Yeah, so we have Stanford and DeBakey classifications. We follow the Stanford classification because it's very simple. A and B. So Stanford A means ascending aorta is involved. A for ascending. B means ascending is not involved, only descending. If ascending is involved, there is very high risk that the flap can go into the aortic root and can cause aortic regurgitation which can lead to death. So that is why we want to do immediate surgery whereas B we can do conservative medical management and the drug of choice here is what? It is the shortest acting beta blocker. Hypertension is the risk factor. We want to give esmolol. Yeah. So esmolol is the drug of choice for Stanford B. Fine. So this is about everything about aortic dissection that you want to no. Fine. So this is that. Number 22, one more vascular emergency. So what do you see here? Now we can see that the contrast is maximally in the pulmonary artery. So this investigation is CTPA, CT pulmonary angiography. So it is a CCT, but the contrast is maximally within the pulmonary artery. So this is CT pulmonary angiography and you can see that there is presence of this filling defect within the pulmonary artery. So the diagnosis is pulmonary embolism. Yeah, so here you would have risk factors, 
like a long haul flight patient has has been immobilized for a long time or patient has some sort of a pro coagulant state you know or maybe a catheter which is inserted so some sort of risk factor for a deep vein thrombosis which embolizes and leads to acute dyspnea which is pulmonary embolism right so this is the clinical picture that they'll give you pulmonary embolism we use a clinical score to determine whether uh, there is a uh, a risk of embolism or not so what is the clinical criteria that you are going to be using what the being neat is such a time taking job <laughs> so the criteria that we are going to be using is the wells score yeah so wells score is what we are going to be using or a modified wells score is what we are going to be using so if the score is less than 4 yeah then it means that the risk is lower so we go for the most sensitive investigation so what am i going to do for this patient who has a well score of less than 4 i want to go for d dimer so d dimer is very sensitive but the thing is it can be raised in so many conditions it's not specific yeah so d dimer because sensitivity is 100% so if d dimer comes out negative i can rule out p ki ye to nahi hai right if d dimer is positive or if the well score is more than 4 means clinical suspicion is very high then what do you want to go for then you want to go ahead with investigation of choice which is ct pa right so then we go ahead with ct pa for all of these patients yeah you should remember the score it's very easy i mean no need to memorize everything it is such an easy score because isme two points to hamare liye hi hai that if you feel that alternative diagnosis is unlikely take two points so if clinically you know you feel ki they have given you some sort of a risk factor for dvt they have given you acute chest pain and you feel that okay it is pulmonary embolism four to vaise ho gaya right so that is why that score is something which is not very important that's because the tab of um, <laughs> why am i cribbing with the uh, tab of the the unacademy app no that is not very it's not very good whereas uh, notability gives you very nice control over the pain that's why my writing is actually this good and i don't have the patience the other thing is i don't have patience to write so beautifully that's the other problem so this is pulmonary embolism if i go slow and i write nicely i can but i don't want to waste your time you know so that's the point i i would rather say two more points than write beautifully that's the whole thing okay right so what about image number 23 what is uh, this <laughs> diagnosis This is easy, all right. This comes in the exam a lot of times, so you can see the bowel loops going into the thorax. No, this is not pneumonitis intestinalis. No, no, no. This is bowel loops going into the thorax. Yeah. So this is congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Yeah, na. So congenital diaphragmatic hernia because diaphragm has a defect congenitally. Is of two types. There are two main types of CDH, which is the more common type and which is the type that you are seeing here. it is the bockdelic type yeah so this is more common and the morgagni type is not very very common it is seen later on whereas bockdelic hernia presents at birth because you are having all of these things which are going inside right so you are having all of the bowel loops which are going in the chest so it presents with neonatal respiratory distress and the typical word they'll write is scaphoid abdomen hai na ki abdomen is very pichka hua because all the bowel loops have come in the thorax correct you remember b p L. Oh God! Just hold on, guys. So BPL. Okay, I'm still fine. So very okay. Okay, cool. Eraser was on. So BPL. A bogdalic hernia will be through a posterior defect on the. left side yeah so it's through a posterior defect on the left side whereas morgagni is opposite it's through an anterior defect on the right side and presents later on okay so this is about bpl few more things what is the next step so if they give you the imaging they tell you the clinical picture that the child has respiratory distress scaphoid abdomen they give you the x ray what do you think you want to do next so first always remember irrespective of setting first is always a b c d e that you want to do for every patient right so here this patient cannot breathe so you want to put in an e t tube next right apart from e t tube we also want to put in an n g tube to decompress the bowel loops that will make sure that the lungs expand further right so can you see how there is a tube here this tube here is the e t tube and can you also see there is one more tube which is going 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 and going here so this is the ng tube which also confirms your diagnosis that it is basically indeed cdh it is not anything else it is indeed cdh because the stomach is also in the thorax so the ng tube is pointing in the 
thorax right apart from that can you see how there is a contralateral heart shift the heart is pushed here so neither this lung is inflated neither the other lung is maximally inflated because the heart is pushed so what do you think is happening what is the most important prognostic factor here it's going to be pulmonary hypoplasia yeah so pulmonary hypoplasia is the most common uh, progno most important prognostic factor thank you so much dr tamil and congratulations yeah i am very happy that there is a new radiologist in town very good so this is pulmonary hypoplasia so these are your next steps and one contraindication very important we do not bag these patients right so bag and mask ventilation is contraindicated because that will further lead to inflation of the bowel loops okay so this is everything that you want to know about cdh okay right what do you think is the location of foreign body so as you can see ki coin kha liya hai there is a baby who has eaten a coin eaten or aspirated a coin so now where is the coin in image a and where is the coin in image b that is the question that they'll give you so when you see that the coin is completely rounded n profile very nice this is within the esophagus but when you see that the coin is seen like a slit then where is it located that is in the trachea yeah so this is how on the basis of the shape we can decide where the foreign body is and this ditto question came in your last year neat exam okay so this is extremely important why is this the difference why is there this difference because trachea is like a c you have c shaped cartilage right so wo pura aise khul nahi pata so the coin will have to go under a side profile okay how to distinguish this from a button battery so button battery you will get these two margins all right because battery is thick no it's not flat like a coin it has a dimension to it a height to it so that is why you will see a beveled margin so that is how you can actually see whether it's a, a button battery or a coin if it's a button battery which is stuck you want to remove it immediately yeah so the management is going to be immediate removal because the battery will cause tissue necrosis it releases these alkali and you know from uh, corrosive ingestion also that alkalis are more dangerous than acids right so that is why alkali will cause this liquefactive necrosis and that is why it needs to be removed immediately theek hai ha so this is about the management protocol okay right what about this this is something which also also come last year exam mein ha usually manali good question ki trachea mein nahi rahega it might go into right main stem bronchus but kai baar trachea mein bhi atak jata hai right sometime most likely it will go in the right main stem bronchus because it is more horizontal yeah coming back to this as you are all identifying wonderfully this is the earliest most severe congenital anomaly to be picked up where there is no skull right so it is actually a sequence so there is acrania means that the cranium is absent that leads to exencephaly means that the brain is exposed outside exencephaly and finally because the brain is exposed it would disappear it would be absorbed which is anencephaly right so this is the sequence that you call and this is the earliest anomaly to be picked up as early as 10 to 12 weeks rest of the anomalies we would pick up usually at the 18 to 22 week scan which is the anomaly scan so this is the earliest anomaly to be picked up you will see that on the coronal profile the eyes look very predominant which is called as frog eyes and in the sagittal profile this was the image based question in the last exam you will see that the skull is exposed right you are not seeing any brain tissue here yeah so this is about anencephaly and how do you prevent these neural tube defects so every female has to take folic acid yeah so the prevention of all neural tube defects is going to be by folic acid it has to ideally be started 3 months before conception right so 3 months before conception we are starting what is the dose that you will give a normal female who has no uh, risk you want to give 0.5 mg right so 3 months before uh, uh, pregnancy you want to start and if there is prior history of neural tube defect the dose will increase by 5 mg yes yeah, so 4 mg or 5 mg whatever you want to remember technically correct is 4 yeah but in in india the dose which we get is always 0.5 or 5 4 mg ki tablet hi nahi milti okay so 0.5 mg and 5 mg is the dosage that you want to remember for folic acid as well okay so this is about anencephaly all right one more baby so one more anomaly scan we were doing and we saw that at the level of bladder this is the kind of appearance i had bladder is very much distended and so is this posterior urethra 
which gives me an appearance called a keyhole sign. So antenatally, I am seeing that the bladder is distended, the posterior urethra is distended. So there must be some obstruction here, right? Correct. So the diagnosis is PUV, posterior urethral valves. Yeah. And what is the investigation of choice for posterior urethral valves? When you see this appearance, when the baby is born, you want to do this investigation, which is MCU. Micturating cystourethrography. So we put a foliage in the baby. You will fill the bladder with contrast and saline. And when the baby starts to pass you, then you will take an x-ray. So what will happen? The bladder is distended because you put saline and contrast. You will find that when the baby maturates, posterior urethra is very much dilated. But because there is a valve here, there is a, a obstruction here, the rest of the urethra becomes very tiny. Yeah, so there is this transition from posterior urethra to anterior urethra that you're going to see on the MCU. And that is why it's the investigation of choice. Yeah, it's always going to be a male child. Okay. And remember, posterior urethral valve uh, can also lead to Potter sequence. One of you mentioned Potter sequence for something else, but this is where we use Potter sequence. Yeah. So Potter sequence mein kya hoga? because there is obstruction. Yeah, there is obstruction to urinary flow. In fact, this is the most common cause of obstructive uropathy in children. This was also a one-liner question in last year's exam. Most common cause of obstructive uropathy in children kya hai? It is PUV. Yeah, so we're covering a lot of questions as we go along. So this is uh, PUV. And what happens? Because urine cannot pass, you will have what kind of liquor? You will have oligohydramnios. And because of oligohydramnios, what will happen? Yes, you will have water-like facies and you will also have pulmonary hypoplasia, yeah, which can lead to fetal demise. All right. So, this is what we can have. Renal agenesis is also one of the other causes. Okay. But PUV is also one of the causes, right? That's why we are discussing this here. Okay. So, everything about PUV, is this clear? Everybody, Potter sequence, most common obstructive uropathy, investigation of choice and images. Okay. Image number 27. Tell me diagnosis, guys. What is the diagnosis here? Fever, cough, and when you see that there are, I'm still here, right? Yeah. When you see that there are so many nodules, very tiny, tiny nodules in bilateral lung fields, the x ray is showing you, the CT is showing you, very simple. This is millet shaped miliary TB. Yeah. So the name has been derived from millets. So these nodules are very tiny. This always would be bilateral. Why? Because unlike normal TB, which spreads via the bronchi, this is spreading via the hematogenous root. Yeah? So this falls under the pathophysiology of primary progressive tuberculosis. Yeah, So this is progressive TB, where it goes in the bloodstream and then it goes into bilateral lung fields. So tiny millet shaped nodules, 1 to 3 millimeters in size, always think of miliary TB. We cannot differentiate it from varicella. So, this miliary pattern has a lot of differentials. Apart from TB, there are various DD. So, you have to rely on the history. So, what are the various differentials? Healed varicella yeah, can be one differentials. Rarely, you can have metastasis. Miliary metastasis, which can be very, very tiny. Came in last year's, last to last year, I think AIMS exam had a question on tropical pulmonary eosinophilia. Really, that can also have miliary mottling. Yeah, so TPE or Loeffler syndrome is also one thing which can have a miliary pattern of uh, uh, disease. Apart from that, yes, histoplasmosis as well. And one more thing is pulmonary hemosidrosis. Hemosidrosis, which can occur because of mitral stenosis. Yeah, so there's a long list of differentials that you don't really need to remember, but do keep in mind that everything is possible here. Okay, we'll talk about train, but it is it's gonna come in one of the images. Okay, so this is miliary TB. Silicosis also, yeah. In fact, pneumoconiosis and silicosis will also can also lead to this pattern very rarely, yeah, but not very common. But pneumoconiosis, silicosis, both can also have miliary pattern. So very very non-specific. I mean, you don't need to remember this entire list, but whenever you know ask a question, you can remember this. Okay, yeah. What about this? What do you see here? Patient presents with cough with a lot of expectoration, lot of sputum production. Crazy pavement manali would be seen in a very rare type of silicosis, which is acute silicosis. Usually silicosis will take 10 to 20 years to appear if it is acute. 
that is when you see crazy paving okay right so this is bronchiectasis so this is bronchiectasis indeed this is something that that will always get you questioned right you'll always get a question from bronchiectasis which would be an image based question so here what we will see is on the x ray we have this dilated bronchi can you see all of these channels here these are all your dilated bronchi that you are seeing as shadows yeah so this is called as the tram track sign yeah so this is called as the tram track sign and on the ct what you will see so normally you have the white vessel and the black bronchus which go hand in hand yeah so basically you will have that both of these uh, are same in size what happens in bronchiectasis dilatation of the bronchi so artery will remain same but this this bronchus enlarges so this is called as the signet ring sign so both of these signs we are going to see remember investigation of choice for bronchiectasis is high resolution ct yeah so hrct is the investigation of choice for bronchiectasis is what you want to remember here okay Going on to the next, this year ka need saval. All of these are questions which have come. Um, so this is again a high resolution CT that you are seeing, and can you see how there is this diffuse confluent opacity? So whenever you see this kind of an opacity, this is something which means that the alveoli are opacified, right? So there's alveolar opacification, and you have this bronchus which is coursing within it, which is black. So this is the air bronchogram. Sorry, is the air bronchogram sign, which basically indicates that there is alveolar opacification, but the bronchus is patent. Yeah, bronchus is not obstructed. So this is seen in consolidation. Yeah, so this is seen in consolidation. Now, when you get a history of pneumonia, like pus, I mean uh, fever and pus expectoration, that is pneumonia, which is also a consolidation. If you get history of, yeah, something fell. If you get history of, uh, uh. Heart failure, it is pulmonary edema. So all of these are causes of consolidation. Okay, so this is air bronchogram sign. Next image, again, what we have is a consolidation. Can you see how there is this confluent opacity on the X-ray? What I want you to tell me is where is this located? Is this in the upper lobe, middle lobe, lower lobe? First of all, right or left? Obviously, it's on the left side. So now you'll tell me whether it's in the left upper lobe, lingula, or left lower lobe, and how do we decide? So to decide what sign am I going to use, guys? Yes, I'm going to use the silhouette sign. So the silhouette sign tells me that if there is loss of margin with the heart, the opacity heart ke saath more jori hai. Can you see how in this case we cannot differentiate where the opacity ends and where the heart shadow begins, right? Both of them are merging into one another. So this is called as silhouetting the heart. So this means that it is in the middle loop. Again, when they give you lateral, they are making your job very easy. Lateral may you just have to see is it overlying the heart? Yes. Can you see how opacity is here? It is in the middle lobe. If you see that it is falling behind and obscuring the spine, that is called as the spine sign, and that means that it is in the lower lobe. So, if heart is overlying, hai, it is middle lobe. If it is it is lower lobe. So here. What is the area where the uh, consolidation is? It is in the lingula. So this is a lingula consolidation. This is a repeat FMG exam and very high odds of coming into the NEET exam as well. All right. So this is silhouette sign. Got it? Everybody, how to apply? Just see if the heart borders are maintained or not. If you see that the opacity is going in the heart, it is in the lingula or the middle lobe. Right me to right middle lobe, left me to lingula. Okay. Going on to the next image. So here we have two kinds of obstructions. I want you to tell me which obstruction is which. Okay. So here in the first X-ray, can you all see that there are multiple air fluid levels? Kind of horizontal air fluid levels are multiple. Second, can you see how these loops are central? So first, air fluid level. Second, centrally located. Third, can you see the presence of these complete folds within the loop? These are your valvule conventus, which tell you that this is jejunum. Yeah, so you have these complete mucosal folds called valvule conventus or walls of Kirkring. Yeah, so Nandini, as I said, if they don't give lateral, still we know, right? Silhouette sign is on the frontal view only, so you can still know, isn't it? So whenever you have all of these three features, it is small bowel obstruction. But look at the second image. Can you see how? 
the peripheral loop is obstructed and there are these incomplete folds called the hostrations. So if you follow this, you can see how this loop here, this loop here going from above and then reaching till here is obstructed, air filled bowel loop and you can see that, okay, there must be some obstruction here. There's a cutoff here, right? So this is about large bowel obstruction. So when you have a peripheral loop and you have hostrations, incomplete mucosal folds, as a hostrations, this becomes large bowel obstruction. Yes, so concertina effect is this only because of walls of curve ring, you'll have this feathery sort of an appearance when you look at the barium, okay. So this is not colon cutoff sign per se, that is predominantly described in acute pancreatitis, but yes, there's a cutoff here which tells you that the cause of obstruction is something here. Yeah, so small bowel versus large bowel on the x-ray is clear, guys. For small bowel, we need a dilatation more than 3 centimeters. For large bowel, we need a dilatation more than 6 centimeters. What is the most common cause of small bowel obstruction? It is adhesions. Yeah, so adhesions are the most common cause. So, you will get a history of some sort of prior surgery. Purana koi surgery hoaga, which has led to adhesions and that is leading to small bowel obstruction where the most common cause of large bowel obstruction remember is malignancy yeah so cancer is the most common cause here apart from that the other thing you want to remember management so most of the times management of sbo is going to be conservative you wait for 24 hours it will usually dissolve in less than 24 hours if it doesn't resolve you go to surgery whereas large bowel will never resolve malignancy is the most common cause right it won't resolve in 24 hours the management here is surgical okay so this is everything in a nutshell that you need to know about small bowel and large bowel obstruction see because we are making our job simpler right ramana it is not like you have to memorize these signs in fact if you ever do a radiology residency you will uh, realize that we never ever talk about these signs you know because no patient will come and tell you that I have double bubble sign. What is my diagnosis? You know, so it's something that you make your job easier. Ki jab hum dekh rahe hai toh, achha, this looks like double bubble. So it becomes easier to um, notice that pattern, you know. So that is why these signs ha have been named. But when you go in a day to day practice, it's not like you're going to see those signs. You need to know what every sign looks like and only then you can pick it up. Yeah, so radiology is all about knowing stuff. So the eye sees what the mind knows is what's a famous saying, right? So only if you know what you're looking for, you'll see. Baki sign is just a helpful tool, okay? Ha, see, come more than 9 centimeter, yes. So that is called as the rule of 3, 6, 9. Small bowel, large bowel, see, come. Okay, I, I guess we can stop here um, and we can continue tomorrow. So 40 minutes or time I have with me in every class. So I guess a good point to stop would be this. So um, tomorrow we'll continue with this series. Hopefully tomorrow we can reach till the halfway mark, which is number 50. Yeah, double bubble sign indeed is seen in duodenal atresia. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. And I'll see you all tomorrow, four o'clock. Apart from that, we do have a class uh, today at 10 p.m. Yeah. So today is 10 p.m. We have a strategy class. So this is the schedule that you can keep in mind. So today, 10 o'clock, two months to uh, two months strategy for INICP. Okay. Thank you so much. And I'll post this annotated PDF. Uh, okay. I know. All right.